Proverbs 11 verse 12 It is foolish to belittle a neighbor. A person with good sense remains silent. As a child of God, we must all have the ability to exercise silence. Notice how the verse says a person with good sense remains silent. There will be moments when our neighbor will anger us. And for a lot of us, our closest neighbors are our family members, our husbands, our wives, our children. And we all have disagreements at one point or another. This is a natural part of human interaction, though we all wish we could all just get along all the time. But even in the most peaceful families, there are disagreements. Even when we are angered and wronged, we are forbidden by God from belittling our neighbors. Solomon tells us it is foolish so to do this. Wisdom is not only expressed when we speak, but also when we choose to keep silent. Let me say that one more time. Wisdom is not only expressed when we speak, but also when we choose to keep silent. A person demonstrates wisdom when they speak and also when they remain silent. Proverbs 17 verse 28 Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. There is a respectable level of prudence in learning the art of silence. We must also learn to use this art, as difficult as it is when we don't understand our predicaments. Instead of speaking irrationally, hold your tongue. Instead of being insubordinate, hold your tongue. Instead of lashing out when you are angry, hold your tongue. Let your silence shout for the glory of God. Don't be quick to anger and let your tongue run riot on your family. Now let's look at idle words. Proverbs 10 verse 19 to 21 Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. The words of the godly are like sterling silver. The heart of a fool is worthless. The words of the godly encourage many, but fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. Idle words are as the Proverbs put it, they lack common sense. They are insensible. The Greek word argos here translated as idle, means inactive, unfruitful, barren, lazy, useless or unprofitable. Have you been using idle words? There is a frightening warning from the lips of Jesus that will assist us to work out the salvation of our tongues with fear and trembling. Matthew 12 verse 36 to 37 But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. What will you say? What will you do? When our lives are being reviewed, Every day will be in review. This is a day in which we cannot avoid. It doesn't matter if you run to the east or to the west. You will stand before him. You will come before his judgment seat. You cannot outrun a God who can speak whole worlds out of nothing. It's nothing to him to raise the dead and to bring them to the judgment seat that they may speak to him about the way that they've lived and thought and spoken and acted. And God, the great King and the only potentate, guarantees that every evil word will be remembered. Every evil act 
will be called to account. Every evil thought will be published openly. We don't know how long this day will be because we will be eternity. So if God chooses, he could go through the life of all the billions of people that have ever lived and go through each of their life at its present speed. So he could take 24 hours to examine 24 hours. Just think how different we would live our life if we had this idea in our minds, that God will one day examine every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, every month, of every year, of every decade, of every century. I'm asking you to live in such a way that you know you will have to give account one day of your life. You will have to stand before him, and on that day, will you regret the words that you spoke aimlessly? God wants us to be intentional in the things we say. If life and death are in the power of the tongue, we must not be frivolous with our words. We must weigh the things we say before we aim them at another person, or before we aim them at ourselves. We are told that as good members of the kingdom, we are commanded to avoid all empty, vain, useless, idle talk, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. 2 Timothy 2 verse 16. Now let us look at murmuring and complaining. Proverbs 19 verse 3. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. At the beginning of our deliberation on words, it was mentioned that we speak out of the fullness of the heart. If we persist in idleness, the emptiness of speech, and foolish conversation, ruin lies in our way. Folly seldom goes without consequences. Okay, some may argue that it is okay to sometimes complain, but that is not true for the child of God. The happenstances of life may bring us into some hardship. Even in these situations, we must exercise self-control and restraint. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 9 and 10 Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes, nor should we complain as some of them did. We have the murmuring of the children of Israel as an example that God despises a raging heart and murmuring lips. Numbers 11 verse 1 posits, Now the people began complaining openly before the Lord about hardship. When the Lord heard, his anger burned. Did you hear that? When the Lord heard, he was burned with anger. What have you been complaining about? What have you been murmuring about? As a believer, we need to be in a constant state of gratitude, a constant state of thanksgiving. Listen to me. There are people in the hospital right now at this moment begging God for the opportunity that you have. There are people in another part of the world right now begging God for the quality of life that you have. Stop your murmuring and stop your complaining. Whenever you feel like murmuring or complaining, use the art of silence. We are told that with faith we can say to the mountain, move out of my way and go into the sea, and that mountain will move. Words are not empty. They must not be reduced to mere trembling of the vocal cords and the shaping of the lips. 
Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Every idle word will be judged. Judgment day is not a day you can avoid. You can avoid coming to church. You can avoid reading your Bible. You can avoid me. You can even avoid your own responsibilities. But the Bible makes it clear to us there is an appointment that you and I cannot avoid. Hebrews 9.27 And just as it appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Either by death or the second coming, judgment day is not an event everyone has a choice and freedom to attend or not attend. But it is a day that is appointed to all humans to receive their reward for everything they have done, either good or bad. The truth is that God loves us so much that he told us there would be a judgment day. Imagine how unloving God would be if he never told us that there would be a judgment day. But we see in this Bible time and time again that we are forewarned that there is a real day of judgment. The Bible repeatedly tells us that one day our lives will be examined. Matthew 12, verse 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Jude 1, verses 14 and 15. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Romans 2 verse 16 On that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So I want to ask you today, are you aware of the things your life will be reviewed on? Today we are going to focus on one of them. Let us look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by thou words thou shalt be justified, and by thou words thou shalt be condemned. To us they may seem insignificant at times, but words are powerful things. God's words were so powerful that they actually created everything. Proverbs 18.21 highlights that death and life are in the power of the tongue. In Matthew 12, verse 36, there are two crucial words in this verse. The first word is the word idle. It comes from the Greek word argos, meaning not busy, idle, inactive, doing nothing, and sterile. When we apply it as Jesus did here in Matthew 12, verse 36, it has the idea of careless or casual words. Our second word, account, comes from the Greek word apodiomi, which means give an answer. Jesus is saying that everyone will have to give God an answer for even their casual comments. According to the undergraduate biology research program, the average person uses around 16,000 words per day. That is 112,000 words per week. That is 448,000 words per month. That is 5,280,000 words per year. That is 52,800,000 words per decade. All the while, a record of each of these words is being kept. I don't know how God keeps accounts of the words of every single person, but there is a record. Someday I will stand before the Lord, and you will, and he will judge individuals by every single word we have ever spoken. I do not look forward to that review. Every idle word, every passing comment, every off-color remark, will be examined. On Judgment Day, not only the best parts of your life will be examined, but God will be digging into the details of your life, every word, every decision, every action, and every thought. This is why we should be careful without words. The scripture enlightens us vividly about how the Judgment Day will be. There will be two parts to follow. A part will entail those who have accepted Jesus Christ as God's gift of eternal life and have strong faith in him. John 5 verses 22 and 23. For the Father judges no one, 
but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This is where Jesus will examine each believer's words and works and determine what rewards will be given or withheld in eternity, as in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. That judgment does not determine eternal destiny, nor can a believer lose their salvation there, as in John 10 verse 28. I give them eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The second part is where the non-believers will be judged on their own self-righteousness and come short of accomplishing God's preferences. We see this in Romans 3 verse 23. This is frequently referred to as the white throne judgment. When Jesus returns, we will be accountable for every action and word. This also includes every careless word we've spoken. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. It is our Lord who spoke this word. Let's ponder his warning. He forgets not a single one of our words, even if we forget many. Do you remember every word you spoke last week? Proverbs 10 verse 19 says, Where there are many words, there is no sin without sin. Talking is a gift, but it is also a great responsibility. We have forgotten what we said or talked about to one of our fellow human beings, but God did not forget it. He wrote it down. What a harvest awaits us on Judgment Day. There is a persuasiveness in speech. An influence can emanate from it that inflicts blows, leaves deep marks, and has long-lasting consequences. In the person concerned, the spoken words remain like a moral poison that make them sad, torment them, and bring them into inner darkness. But those guilty of it will not go unpunished. We easily forget, but God forgets nothing. What we have forgotten continues to do its harmful work. Those who have harmed the reputation of others through slander can keep a good reputation themselves, sing spiritual songs, and take the sacrament. But do you see the profanation, superficiality, and hypocrisy that lies in it as God sees it? What do you do? We must be so overwhelmed by the recognition of our guilt that we learn to be silent once and for all and listen for what God says. But I tell you on that day of judgment, people must give an account of every idle word they have spoken. These are the things that we can and must fix, primarily with the people we have harmed and also with those we talked to. But and this is very serious, there is an injustice we cannot undo. I want to watch my way so that I do not sin with my tongue. I will keep my mouth in check. Lord, put a watch on my mouth, said David in Psalm 39, 2 and 141, verse 3. And it is said of the Lord Jesus that words of grace came out of his mouth. Luke 4, verse 22. Words tell you whether someone has a good or a bad heart but it is the heart that justifies or condemns us before God. Today, on the day of repentance, let us search our hearts. We only need to ask what kind of fruit it produces out of our mouth. What do we have to compare our words with? Are they rotten eggs that we throw at others, with which we shame, annoy, or humiliate them? Or are they pieces of jewelry with which we adorn and honor our fellow human beings? Are our words clubs that we hit others over the head with? Or are they like an ointment that heals wounds? Are our words like pudding, vague, suggestive, and disgustingly sweet? Or are they a crisp fruit, clear and rich in vitamins? Are our words peacock feathers that we found somewhere and with which we adorn ourselves? Or are they simple pieces of clothing in which we don't look richer than we are? Are our words like pancakes with mustard filling? Or are they honest like a piece of black bread? In any case, our words show something of what our hearts are like. We should always have it at the back of our mind that every word and every action count on the judgment day. There won't be any reason to justify our words, but all will be charged either to our favor or against us. We have the choice to decide now and be cautious and watchful of any idle word. God bless you. Galatians 6, 7 Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can mock me, 
but you cannot mock God. There is an eternal God that cannot be mocked, that is kept account of everything. Proverbs 16, verse 28. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. This sermon may seem strange, because it is not the regular kind of sermon given in churches. It is a sermon about gossip. Gossip is a grave sin that can cause danger to anyone, anywhere, anyhow, and any time. Friendships have ended because of rumors and gossip. Gossip has ended relationships, partnerships. Gossip has even split up church congregations. Gossip is not limited to the church only. It happens everywhere, where people congregate regularly. It happens in families, offices, factories, high schools, colleges, and even in churches. I think the only adequate way to describe this sin is that it is an acceptable sin. Gossip is one of the most acceptable sins in the church today. Gossip is so common in churches and we have become familiar with it, so much so we don't notice it anymore. The church is so quick to judge a drunkard, someone who drinks alcohol, or even someone who uses drugs, but gossips get a free pass every time. It doesn't matter what you call gossip, it is a sin, and it must stop. Roots of gossip can be seen in Romans 1 verse 29, which says, They are fully of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, so you see the context of it, deceit, maliciousness, slander. It is really ugly, and it is right up there with things that hurt people. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 20. There may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit. There it is, back to back, with slander again. So... Gossip is something hurtful. It is something that damages community and damages people. If you don't know, this sin has destroyed many churches today. It has made people leave churches because the church congregation won't stop talking about them secretly in the church. Why should this continue? We must stop this act. What God told us to do is to speak edifying things, not gossip. Do you want to know what God will do to people who gossip? He said he will destroy them. Psalm 101 verse 5 Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. God said that, not me. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. God takes gossiping very seriously. This is why the name of this sermon is Secrets. Who are you secretly slandering? Luke 8 verse 17 For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Everything that is done in secret will be brought out into the light. When you gossip, you are breaking the second commandment given to us by Jesus. This is the word of the Lord to all of us. We must stop the gossip. Ask yourself, how do you feel? When you know that someone just talked bad about you to different people, the way you feel is the way others will feel when they find out you are talking about them secretly. If we want to help someone, let us help them without slandering them. No one wants that for themselves. Gossip is always full of lies, 
People exaggerate most of the time when gossiping. That lie is a sin, and talking of someone negatively is a sin. Why is gossiping a sin? Even though some people must have been taught in the church that it is a sin, they might not find it to be a sin, not because they are not convinced it is a sin, but because gossiping has been deep-rooted in their lives. So much so, they cannot do without it. It is as if life is boring without gossiping. Gossiping can make you popular, it can get you friends, and it can make you feel like you are important. Who wouldn't like to hear about other people's lives? One of the things that God hates is telling lies, deceit. God doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care about your position in the church. If you tell lies, and you spread it for others to hear of it, you are not pleasing God. The Bible says that we must keep evil out of our mouths. We must stop speaking evil of another person just because you want others to know about it. God hates that. You have to stop it. Psalm 34 verse 13 says, Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. The Bible also said in Ephesians 4 verse 29 that, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Gossip is a corrupt communication that the Lord is against, and if you do it, you have gone against the Lord. It is a sin. The Bible also called the people who go about gossiping the idol. They become idle so that they can spread information about other people. 1 Timothy 5 verse 13 and with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Gossip destroys the lives of others. There are many people out there who have been deprived of things that can make them great because someone spread rumors about them. People's credibility has been destroyed because of gossip. You do this, and you think it is not a sin? Do you think God will be pleased with you for slander? What you are doing can destroy a life. It can push someone into depression, and even push them over the edge. We don't know what people are going through in their personal lives. Look at everyone you see, and think of everyone you know. Every single one of them is going through some sort of battle. They may hide that battle behind a smile, but don't be fooled. They are in a battle. And you, as a Christian, don't need to add to their load by gossiping. Gossip reduces trust. This is how it works. The person you talked to about another person will not trust you, because they will feel you will talk about them the same way to another person, Keep talking about people behind their back if you think you are entertaining others. What you are doing to yourself is that nobody will trust you. They will believe that you will keep talking about them to others. When people see you, they might start to hide because they are afraid you will want to know about them. You need to stop gossiping. After all of this, are you still thinking it is normal to gossip? Are you still thinking God doesn't care about you gossiping? Or are you still thinking that you are trying to get help for the people you are talking about? Gossip is a dangerous sin which we must stop. I will not deceive you. God said he would destroy those who involve in this act. He doesn't care if you are a pastor. You must get it right. God doesn't care if you hold an important role in the church. If you don't stop to gossip, he will cut you off. We don't want to be cut off. We don't want to be the reason there is no unity in the church. We don't want to be the reason why hatred thrives in the church. If you have caused damage through gossip before, it is time to adjust 
and clear the evil you have spoken about another person. Concentrate on the important thing, and never let slander out of your mouth. Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The second commandment, Love your neighbor. Your neighbor is not necessarily that person who lives next door. Your neighbor is anyone who you have the capacity to help. Let's see Jesus' response to Who is my neighbor in Luke 10? But he, desiring to justify himself, asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered, saying, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, You go and do likewise. Everyone around you is your neighbor, and you must be ever willing to show love to as many people as possible. The Bible tells us that when Jesus walked on earth, he went about doing good. This is how we also should live. We should be glad to offer help to those who need it. When we walk in love towards people, it will be difficult to sin against them. Would you steal from someone you love? No. When we walk in love, we cannot sin against each other. If we love God, we will keep His commandments. 1 John 5 verse 3 Mark chapter 4, verses 24 through 25 says, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. Other version of the first line in Mark chapter 4, verse 24 states, Carefully consider what you hear. Jesus gave us several warnings during his earthly ministry. He did not at any point coerce anyone to do anything or to obey him. It is very obvious from scriptures that Christ gave everyone the opportunity to make their own decisions and to choose. However, he will always state the repercussion and the consequence for every choice we make. Jesus didn't sugarcoat anything. He didn't beat around the bush. He was very blunt. Yes, it is true that we have our choices to make but we cannot choose the consequences of our decisions. There are times in the Bible when Jesus would say that, let those who have ears hear what he says. This statement has great implications. It means that you have the choice of hearing. You may choose to hear what he says, and you may also choose to ignore it. Another implication of that saying is that those who truly have ears will listen to the words of Christ and act promptly on them. The best way to prove that our spiritual ears are functional is for us to hear the words of Christ and obey them. Jesus warns us, take heed of what we hear in Mark chapter 4 verses 24 through 25. It's vital to take Mark chapter 4 verses 24 through 25 within the context of the whole chapter. Jesus is speaking about different reactions people have upon hearing his teaching. What Jesus is saying in this verse is, pay attention to the words that I speak to you, for they will benefit you. We also see in John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus stating, The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. For us to understand better, the Bible also tells us that our faith is built on what we hear. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Which gives us the parameters of what we must hear. Therefore, what the word of God says is beneficial to one's faith. But I want to focus on that one phrase Jesus stated in verse 24. Consider carefully what you hear. Take heed what ye hear. Take heed means to be careful, to be watchful or to be on guard, to pay close attention. What we hear 
is very important to our life. Everyone is a product of the kind of information they subject their ears to over time. There are two basic gates to the heart of every person, the eyes and the ears. In Mark 4 verse 24, Jesus instructs to pay close attention to what we listen to. In that instance, what he was saying because it is profitable to us. It occurred to me that this could also be for all aspects of our lives. The things we listen to enter our hearts. This made so much sense to me why the Bible instructs us to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4 verse 23, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow springs of life. If we guard our ears and take heed to things we listen to, it will be much easier for us to guard our hearts as the Bible instructs. We don't fully comprehend the power in hearing. There is such a great force in hearing that it has the ability to produce what is almost the greatest virtue of every believer. Faith is the prerequisite to becoming and remaining a believer. However, it does not come through a spiritual process. It comes by hearing the word of God. Every believer at one point in their life had to hear the gospel before heeding the call to salvation. Faith does not just come by hearing anything. What must be heard for faith to be produced is the word of God. If the word of God produces faith in our hearts when we hear it, then every unwholesome word we subject our ears to also have negative effects in our lives. The words we hear have their ways of permeating our spirits. Isn't it amazing that when Jacob was to die, he called all his sons together and told them their future? Those he cursed were cursed and those he blessed were blessed. Jacob did not just make his pronouncements. He ensured that all his sons were available to hear what he declared. And as they listened, his words glued to their spirits and gained expression. Today, so many lives and destinies have been destroyed because of wrong counsels. They subjected their ears a gate to their destinies to poisonous words. Now I need to warn you of something dangerous. There are some words that should never be uttered by a born-again believer. The sad thing is a lot of Christians do say these things without thinking. These words bring the exact opposite to life they only bring misery and destruction. These are words that speak against God. Words that oppose the word of God. Such words should never be spoken because of who they attract. The Bible tells us in Psalms 103 verse 20, Bless the Lord, Ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. God's angels hearken to the word of God. Now you can only imagine what evil creatures hearken to words spoken against God. Do not under any circumstances utter words that attract the fallen angels. Words that are contrary to the word of God open doors for falling angels. They are the ones who work against God and love to hear words that are contrary to the word of God. Do not entertain such words 
they will only bring heartache and misfortune. You have been warned. The Bible also warns us in Ephesians 4 verse 29 and 31. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Do not give the agents of the devil any room to enter your mouth and your words. What you proclaim with your mouth is what you will be. If you declare to people that you have no money, I am broke, then you will have no money, you will be broke. Then we want to question God, why is he not blessing us financially? Well, how can he, when you keep speaking against it? When you keep speaking poverty into your life, your words hold more power than you can ever comprehend. Do not give the devil and his angels any help. When you speak a negative thing about yourself and about your life, you are giving these room to perform those things. Any time a word is spoken by Jesus in the Bible, I always pay a special attention to it. I think every believer should imbibe that attitude. For Jesus to have warned us concerning the things we listen to, then there is a lot about it that we do not probably take notice of. What we listen to sometimes affects our faith. They sometimes eat up our ability to take great spiritual steps. Have you ever wondered why our faith struggles and fails? It is because we have not listened enough to the right words. The more you give your ears to listen to the word of God, the more your faith is built up. The more you give your ears to listen to the word of God, the more your faith is built up. I have come to realize that you can't be worded and faithless at the same time. When a hard situation comes your way, the right word to address it will pop up in your spirit. What you need to do about the level of your faith is to increase your word intake. As was said early, the surest way to grow our faith is by reading the word of God. God speaks to us when we read his word. The scriptures are inspired they still contain the life-giving breath of God. It is the truth of God that furnishes faith in the heart of mere mortals. God's truth is revealed in his word. When we foster a steady diet of the word of God, it will add life to our bodies and spirits. If physical meats and food strengthen the body, it is the word that strengthens our souls and spirits. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Our faith will never flourish if we fail to read God's word. We are not called to live by sight. If we cannot depend on our sight, then the only other meaningful alternative is faith. It is the word that lights our path when we are sightless. It is the lamp that brings clarity to our hearts. How can we aspire to grow our faith without falling in love with the discipline of reading God's word? How can we desire to grow our faith without desiring to have him speak to us? I would want to add that you are not just meant to hear the word of God, you must also act them. The ultimate proof that you've heard is that you act. You will not be any different from people who have not heard the word of God if you hear but fail to practice it. So the faith that comes when we hear the word is not passive, but active. It enables us to practice that which we have heard and make it become a reality. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. After we have heard the word of God, we are expected to live by it. Otherwise, we deceive ourselves and make void what we have heard.